The Ghent altarpiece is a so-called polyptych, consisting of 12 panels when the doors are opened and 8 panels when the doors are closed. This is part 2 of a mini-series about this magnificent altarpiece. Last week's video focused on the design and history of Van Eyck's work. This video will analyze the various panels in detail. Before diving into the details, these kind of devotional polyptychs were relatively popular during the 14th and 15th centuries, although not too many of them were made because of their large size and costs. Here's for example the bone altarpiece from around 1450 by Rogier van der Weyden. When the doors are opened, it shows scenes related to the Last Judgment and when closed it follows a similar format as the Ghent altarpiece which was painted two decades earlier. Let's start with the three portraits at the top of the opened altarpiece. On the left is Mary, God at the center and Saint John the Baptist on the right. These panels are dominated by the brightness of the blue, red, green and gold colors. God wears a robe and crown encrusted with gems and pearls. In his left hand is a scepter and he raises his right hand to bless the viewer. The gold brocade behind him includes motifs of grapes and a pelican feeding her young, referring to the sacrifice of Christ. There are various inscriptions we can see in this panel. For example, at the bottom of his robe are the words Kings of Kings and Lords of Lords. And on the step below it we can read the Latin words for Life without death on his head, youth without age on his forehead, joy without sorrow on his right side, and safety without fear on his left side. Finally, the arches on top are inscribed with the following text. This is God the Almighty on account of his divine majesty, the highest, the best of all on account of his goodness, full of sweetness. Looking at Mary, she wears her trademark blue robe while reading a book. Just like God, her robe and crown are decorated with jewels, but we can also notice some flowers and stars above the crown, referring to her virtues. The arches above her contain an inscription from the Book of Wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and above the whole order of the stars. When compared to the light, she is found to precede it for she is the brightness of eternal light and the unspotted mirror of God. Under the green robe we can see the animal skin, identifying this as John the Baptist. He is pointing at God, referring to his role as announcing the coming of Christ. The open book on his lap contains text from Isaiah, referring to Saint John the Baptist's tasks. The inscription on the arches above him reads, this is John the Baptist, great than man, like unto the angels, the son of the law, who sowed the gospel, the voice of the apostles, the silence of the prophets, the lamp of the world, the witness of the Lord. Looking at the panels next to the three main portraits, we can see a panel of angels playing music on the right and a group of singing angels on the left. Both panels contain inscriptions, one of them reading, praise him with stringed instruments and organs. The other one, a song for God, external praise, thanksgiving. Finally, on the outside are the panel of Adam and Eve. Below Adam is an inscription, Adam cast us into death. And below Eve it says, Eve harmed by killing. And above them are two little scenes of Cain and Abel burning their offerings and Cain killing Abel. Notice that Adam and Eve are naked in the original version by Jan van Eyck and that he painted them realistically compared to other naked people painted at that time. And it may not surprise you that not everyone was happy with these nudes and at some point the naked versions were clothed, as you can see here. But nowadays, we can see the originals again. The central panel of the lower register contains arguably the most famous scene of this altarpiece, the adoration of the mystic lamb. 
At the center, the lamb stands on an altar, with blood streaming from his breast into a chalice. The top of the altar has an inscription in gold from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, reading, Behold the Lamb of God, which took away the sin of the world. And the decorative flaps below it contain text from John 14, verse 6, reading, Jesus the way and the truth the life. Two times seven angels are surrounding the altar and they are showing the Arma Christi, the weapons of Christ, which are the objects related to the passion of Christ, including the cross and the swinging censers in the foreground. Moving to the foreground, there is a fountain and at its base is an inscription from the book of Revelations reading, This is the fountain of the water of life proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. The whole scene is set in paradise, filled with flowers and trees and the heavenly city of Jerusalem in the background. Surrounding the altar and fountain are four distinct groups of people praising the Lamb. These are the people representing the Old Covenant, basically the people before the birth of Jesus. Among them in white is the Roman poet Virgil with his laurel red, who was believed to have predicted the coming of Jesus. Next to him in blue is the prophet Isaiah, holding a twig, a reference to his prophecy that Jesus would be a rod out of the stem of Jesse. On the opposite side of the fountain are the people representing the new covenant. In front are the apostles and behind them are several church leaders like popes and bishops. Moving up, we see the group of holy virgins, including some of the better known ones like Ursula, Catherine and Agnes. The fourth group are the confessors together with people representing contemplative life, as opposed to the martyrs. Finally, on top of the dove, representing the Holy Spirit, shining its rays on all of the groups present. However, research has shown that Van Eyck may not have included the dove originally and that it was added later in the 15th century. And notice how the golden rays resemble those surrounding Mary, God and Saint John the Baptist on the top panels. The other panels on the lower register represent even other groups of significant people in the Christian religion. They are making their way to the heavenly meadow to join the groups that are already there. The most left panel, the one for which the original is still missing, shows the just judges followed by the panels with the Knights of Christ. On the other side are the pilgrims, led by the enormous figure of Saint Christopher. And the last panel shows the hermits, led by Saint Anthony Abbot. And we can see two ladies at the back of the group. They are Mary Magdalene and Mary of Egypt. And one more thing about the landscapes in these panels. The landscapes across the central panel and the side panels seem to be connected. And they are to some extent, but the panels on the left show a typical northern European landscape, while the panels on the right show a southern European landscape. To understand what we see on the back panels, let's first look at the bottom half. On the sides are the donors of this altarpiece. On the left is Joos Veit, a Belgian nobleman who commissioned this piece. And on the right is his wife, Elizabeth Borlut. Both of them are captured in praying positions. For the first one and a half century, until the iconoclastic riots, the altarpiece actually stood in their own chapel, in which is now the St. Bevo Cathedral. And this painting from 1829 actually gives an idea on how it would have looked in its original setting. And notice that when we look at the back panels, that while Veit and his wife are modestly positioned on the sides, they do have the brightest colors as the rest of the panels are painted in muted colors. The middle two panels are painted using a grisaille technique, which means only using shades of gray to make them appear as sculptures. On the left is Saint John the Baptist, recognizable by the lamb he is holding, as well as the beard and a piece of animal skin under his robe. 
Saint John the Evangelist is on the right, recognizable by his young face and the chalice with a snake coming out of it, referring to the legend that he could drink poison without being harmed. As for why Van Eyck chose these two saints instead of the many others he could choose from, there are good reasons. Saint John the Baptist was the patron saint of the church for which this altarpiece was intended. And Saint John the Evangelist was the one who had the vision of the adoration of the mystic lamb, the central scene on the inside of the Ghent altarpiece. On top of this, Saint John the Evangelist may have been the patron saint of the chapel in which the work was displayed. This is not absolutely certain, but it is strongly suggested as the altarpiece was dedicated on May 6, the feast day of John the Evangelist. The four panels above it show the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus. On the left is the Archangel Gabriel with its spectacular colorful wings. He has arrived to tell the Virgin Mary on the right that she will give birth to the Son of God. There is an inscription in gold from Luke 1 verse 28 reading, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And Mary's response in gold is also written, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. These texts are written upside down to indicate that they are intended for God above. Mary kneels beside a lectern with the scriptures on top of it and you can see the dove representing the Holy Spirit above her head. The two panels in between them fill the space in which the Annunciation took place. And if we look at the background, we can first see a city, probably Ghent. In the niche, we can see a pot of water with a basin below it and a large hand towel, items that symbolize the purity of the Virgin Mary. On the right is another window where the sunlight shines through a carafe sitting on the sill, a symbol for the Incarnation, a Christian doctrine that God assumed a human nature through Jesus. Finally, notice how both Gabriel and Mary are painted as unusually large compared to the room in which they are depicted. This was to signify their religious importance. Above the scene of the Annunciation are two Sibyls and two prophets watching down. From left to right are the prophet Zechariah, the Eritrean Sibyl, the Cumean Sibyl and the prophet Micah. They are all referring to the prophecies that were made about the coming of Christ. Each of them has a floating ribbon above them, including their prophecies. For example, Zechariah's banderol reads a text from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Behold, your king comes! Above the Eritrean Sibyl, we can read the Latin words that can be translated into Sounding nothing mortal, you are inspired by power from on high. The Cumean Sibyl's ribbon reads the highest king shall come and shall be in the flesh through the ages. And the prophet Micah has a ribbon with his prophecy from Micah 5 verse 2. The ruler of Israel will come from you to rule for me. You may wonder why Sibyls are included in this religious altarpiece as they are mythological figures. It's for the same reason Michelangelo included five Sibyls on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The word Sibyl comes from the ancient Greek word Sibylla, meaning prophetess. These Sibyls could predict the future, often using obscure riddles. The reason that these Sibyls appeared in religious works was that some early church fathers, like Saint Augustine, had given some respect to them by declaring that some of their predictions had foretold some of the most important moments in the New Testament, like the birth and passion of Jesus. They basically were a source for the non-believers to inform them about the truth of Christianity. It may have been a lot of information, but such is the detail that the Van Eyck's included in this altarpiece. I hope you enjoyed this two-part series, and if you haven't seen the first part about the design and history yet, I can recommend you checking it out. 
Finally, if you enjoyed this, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thanks for watching.